Um, hello, my name is Tom Llewellyn. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Director at Shareable.net, which is a nonprofit media outlet, action network, and consultancy that empowers communities to share for a more resilient, equitable, and joyful world. And on behalf of Shareable, Let's Move in Libraries, uh, University of North Carolina Greensboro School of Education, and our event curator who you just heard from, Noah Lenstra, I would like to welcome you all to today's event. According to the USDA's latest Household Food and Insecurity in the United States report, more than 35 million people in the United States experienced hunger in the year 2019. And that number may have even shot up much higher to 42 million people uh, during the last year during the pandemic. And yet across America in major cities that you've heard of and countless places that you probably haven't, uh, public librarians are working with local, state and national partners to bring food to those who need it as trusted members of nearly every community in the United States and in much more of the rest of the world as we've seen as we've got some international people joining us as well, public librarians are uniquely positioned to support food access and food literacy. So today we're hosting this discussion with librarians and non-librarians who manage farmers markets, summer feeding programs, community fridges, and a whole lot more to build a greater understanding of the unique roles of local librarians in community food systems, and hopefully to inspire some new community collaborations with libraries. And so we're gonna to begin today with a series of short presentations from each of our speakers before we open it up into more of an interactive dialogue. So please add your questions in the question section. You can also ask them to the panelists uh, in the chat function. And I'll do my best to, to keep up with that. We've already had quite the flurry, uh, but you can also put them right there in the, in the Q and A section down below. And that's a little bit easier for us. Um, and, and we're gonna kind of integrate them in that, in that dialogue that we have after the, the short presentations. Uh, so today our featured speakers are uh, Patrice uh, Chamberlain, who's the former director of California Summer Meals Coalition and the co-developer of the Lunch at the Library program for the California Library Association. Uh, we have Aurora Sanchez, who's the coordinator of the Healthy Communities program at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, Lee Ann Kazier, uh, who's the Experience Support Specialist at the Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, Erica Frudenberger, uh, who's the Outreach and Engagement Consultant at the Southern Adirondack Library System and the co-founder of the Fresh Food Collective Farm to Library Initiative. So I think we're going to start with, with Erica if you're ready to begin. Terrific. Thank you so much, um, Tom. Shout out to Tom and Noah for bringing us together to talk about the role that public libraries can play in addressing food insecurity. So what do you get when you combine gleaned veggies, rural libraries, and a passion for sharing? In our case, it's our Farm to Library program, which is designed to create healthy, resilient communities. So Tom introduced me. Um, my background is prior to coming to libraries, which is a third or fourth career for me, I spent time as the world's worst waitress. I founded an independent bookstore. I worked as a community organizer and a journalist. So to me, the next logical step in organizing people to build the world they want to live in was to become a librarian. I now work with 34 libraries in four counties in the Adirondacks region of New York, which is several hours north of New York City and very rural. So I want to help people become better readers. But here's the thing. People who might benefit from getting their high school equivalency certification or learning English don't necessarily consider the library as a resource or even a place that's for them. Libraries can be really intimidating if you're not comfortable with the written word or the English language. At the same time, if you're struggling to get food on the table, how do you make time to become a better reader? So we started thinking about this and decided to collaborate with two local food banks, Comfort Food Community in Greenwich, New York, and the Capital Roots Squash Hunger Program in Albany, New York, to address food waste, food access, food insecurity, and adult literacy challenges. Our model embraces whole systems thinking and considers the impact of food waste on the planet. We tap into existing resources and collaborate with our partners to ensure that people can get fresh food. We begin by gleaning food, um, excess food from local farms. And to put this in context, 20 billion pounds of produce is lost on farms each year. And I should say a lot of that is an agribusiness um, 
when what I'm talking about in our region are small local family farms. So we're only rescuing like tens of thousands of pounds of food from local farms, but it's a chance for us to model how to steward and share resources. According to the Rural Sociological Society, 98% of food deserts in this country are in non-metropolitan areas. And a number of our, many of our libraries, I should say, um, serve communities that are in rural food deserts. And that's specifically what we're trying to address. Um, a rural food desert means that grocery shopping is often taking place at a dollar store or a gas station. Um, there aren't any grocery stores within walking distance. And in our air region, we have no public transportation. Uber and all those other things do not exist where we live. Um, for families that have a car, they may have one car and that's used for getting to work. So having a chance to get to a grocery store that could be up to you know, at least 20 to 30 minutes away is really difficult. We piloted the farm to library program with one library in 2017 um, and have been growing it steadily. We, um, we now have 10 libraries in three counties sharing food. And in our first quarter of 2021, we've shared nearly 8,000 pounds of food with more than 1,000 of our friends and neighbors, which makes us super happy. It's also more than we shared in like the first year or two of our program. And it's really exciting to see how it impacts people's lives. One woman came into the, the Pember Library in Granville, New York, really excited. She was in her 70s and she just had her first taste of a fresh beet. While this work benefits our local community, it also corresponds with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Our experience demonstrates that any size library can do this work. We're committed to sustainable consumption and production patterns, reducing inequalities, and contributing to the improved health and well being of our communities. And as a bonus, we get to see new faces in our library, which is awesome. So, if all goes according to my grand evil plan, we're going to save the planet, feed the people, and be better readers. I really believe that we can change the world one community and one library at a time. And what could be more delicious than that? If you want to know more or share your story, please get in touch. Thanks, Erica. And just as a direct follow up, I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about um, specifically how you've done the outreach in communities um, about the, the program. So what's interesting to me is that I was talking to Noah earlier today. Um, one of our new libraries that just came on, Stillwater, started two weeks ago on Monday. They hadn't had a chance to do anything but to put a note on Facebook. And by Wednesday of that week, two days later, 44 families had already been in and taken all the food that was there. What we found, while we have developed um, some marketing materials, we have bookmarks and rack cards that we put out in places like um, post offices, laundromats, doctor's offices, uh, social service social services agencies. Honestly, there's very little we have to do to promote it. It um, Word spreads very quickly. It's We're working with um, a really well-networked population, and everybody just kind of lets their friends and neighbors know about it. And I also want to be really clear, we're sharing food with Anybody can come in and take anything for any reason. We have you know, seniors who come in and take one potato for their dinner for the night. Like anybody who's there is welcome to take it. There's no qualifications. This is really about remo removing stigma and sharing food. Great, thank you. Um, and I think with that, um, we're going to move on to Legan. Just pin that. Legan, are you able to unmute? And I think. Le Leanne, you're Le Leanne, muted. Sorry, Leanne, I think you're still muted. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. I yeah. apologize. Yeah. I'm now here. Here we go. Can we see my screen now? I apologize about yep, that. Uh, yep, but we're seeing it just with. Uh, you you are. The presentation. Here we go. Oh, sorry yep. about that. I knew that Perfect. would happen. Great, thank you. 
Hi, I'm Leanne Kazir. I'm an experienced support specialist here at Richland Library in Columbia, South Carolina, which is the capital of South Carolina. I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about our farmers market that we have here. I'm going to do sort of a high level overview and I hope that we have some time during our discussion that I can talk about specific nuts and bolts about how we get it going. Um, so the genesis of our farmers market here began with the University of South Carolina's Arnold School of Public Health. They piloted a program to use public libraries to try to improve access to uh, healthy foods among our population here. Uh, that began in 2017. Boy, I'm having technical difficulties. I apologize. Um, and it began here at Richland Library with our former director who is no longer here, but she was approached by the School of Public Health to see if Richland Library would like to pilot a farmer's market here. There were a few others in the state, but we were the first ones here in the Midlands of South Carolina. Um, Richland County, according to a 2019 study, is about double the poverty rate of the national average. Um, so this was exactly the right spot for us to pilot a market. Our library's core mission is to connect people with resources. So we want people to have access to information, entertainment, and of course, good health. Uh, so it was difficult to begin at first because we thought about the fact that, can we do a, public, a, a farmer's market at a public library? Is this um, a retail market? And we had difficulty with that, but because we have a programmatic effort that tries to connect customers to all of these um, programs, we decided that, yes, we could do this. And so we have customers have access to fresh food, um, we strengthen our community by connecting our vendors with customers and we, we develop a relationship with vendors as well. And we also are, have the ability because of our relationship with USC and the fact that we do have some in-house social workers that we can coordinate um, customers being able to use SNAP benefits to purchase food here at the library. We also try to make a point of having our vendors also accept SNAP benefits. And that's something that USC helps us with. Now to a little bit of the nuts and bolts. We began our pilot farmer's market here at our main library. That's our largest location. We are a library system of 13 locations spread out about uh, throughout a fairly large county. So we go from a very urban area, which is where I am now at Maine, to very rural communities as well. We decided to pilot it here because it is in a central area of the city. We have very good public transportation here. We do have a large area that we can set up indoors for our market. And I don't know if any of you know about South Carolina summers, but it gets very, very hot and very, very humid. Uh, the market next week is supposed to be hundred degrees. And we do have our social work office located in our main location. By the time, by 2019, we had expanded to two additional locations in our system. Uh, I will say that COVID made things a bit difficult for us. We did miss our entire 2020 season because we were not open to the public at that time. And as of this year, as of April, we reopened our market here at our main location, but we have not opened our, our smaller um, markets at some of our smaller branches. As I said, we do have the resource. We are very lucky of having in, an in-house social work department and they do come to our market and, and assist customers with signing up for SNAP benefits. USC also is an, an advisory role at this point. So they will help customers sign up for SNAP benefits. They help our vendors navigate through the process of becoming vendors who accept retail SNAP payments and um, USC also functions in an advisory role for us in that they check on all of the licensing that's necessary for selling food. And they also help us, you know, just vet vendors. Um, there is a difficulty with trying to make sure that there's no favoritism shown. 
So that's, they, they function as a, in a consulting role for that. I wanted to talk about a few other of our nutritional initiatives here in Richland Library. Uh, during COVID, we established a library of things and in that library of things, which customers can request online and pick up curbside or come in to pick up right now. We do have seed bundles so that customers can start gardens of their own. We also have various pieces of gardening equipment. At one of our locations, we have a community garden. So we do some gardening programs there. We also pick some of the produce that is grown there and make it available for customers. And it was very helpful to have that garden because when we established the library of things and we had the various pieces of gardening equipment, we were able to film some videos to share with customers about how to use the equipment. We also function as a uh, summer food service program in some of our locations. So during the summers, they make food available for teens and children on a, just a walk-in basis. We have formed a partnership with one of the local churches that was involved in it, and that's a USDA program. And thanks so much. I look forward to being able to discuss a little bit more about our markets with you during this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Leanne. And before we, we transition away, I'm wondering um, if you can just kind of touch on what were some of the initial challenges of getting you know, your pilot off the ground? Um, I'm sure it was kind of a, uh, you know, a new idea for the community. And, and whenever there's Absolutely. new ideas that are presented, it, it sometimes takes some finagling. Um, so what were some of the earlier hurdles that you had to kind of get over? I think it was less of a challenge for the community and more for the library as a whole, just to try to reposition ourselves as, you know, ha having a retail market in our spaces. Again, our finance department was concerned about becoming a retail space. Um, and I will say that I was not here for the genesis of all of this. I've, I've been here two years, so I have one market season under my belt at this point. Um, we did begin our our market with one produce vendor and uh, reliability was an issue. Also, we decided to move away from a produce wholesaler, which is what they were, and we are, have moved more toward becoming uh, using local farmers who use organic practices. And that's something we've definitely moved toward. I mean, of course, the pro uh, uh, a challenge always is with libraries or any other kind of organization, well, who will do this and who will have time to do this? And I really do think that at this point, we're pretty much a well-oiled machine and it truly does not take a lot of staff time or effort. And I'm happy to talk about that, you know, if anyone has questions about it, because I think that that is something that a lot of libraries or organizations who would like to have a farmer's market would like and would like to implement it, have those concerns. Thanks, Leanne. Um, Aurora, and, and we had uh, talked about at the beginning that we were going to be hearing from uh, librarians and, and non-librarians, and we started with, with two librarians, and now we're going to hear from, from two uh, quote-unquote, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, non-librarians, and, and, and Aurora, we'll start with you. Good afternoon. It's afternoon where I am. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tom said, let me get this slide going. There we go. Um, as Tom said, my name is Aurora, uh, Aurora Sanchez. I work for the Free Library of Philadelphia. The program that I work on at the Free Library of Philadelphia is called Healthy Communities. Um, so the Free Library of Philadelphia's mission, like so many other libraries, right, we're focused on advancing literacy, learning, curiosity, and just encouraging lifelong learning. Um, and the Culinary Literacy Center in particular um, focuses on literacy through food um, and in engagement with community. So this particular project, Healthy Communities, is done in partnership with the larger city of Philadelphia. We're funded by the Department of Public Health. Um, and through this funding, we are able to increase our capacity to offer health and wellness programming um, throughout the city of Philadelphia. Um, so the Free Library of Philadelphia um, includes 54 libraries, and we partner with just a handful of them. And I put these names up here just for folks who might be familiar with Philadelphia, who might be from Philadelphia, who maybe used to live here, um, just to kind of give you all some context. But we're a city with over 100, I mean, I'm sorry, over 1.5 million people. Um, as a whole, the city is sort of split 
almost down the middle between folks who are black or of African descent and white folks. Um, we also have a, a small population of Latinx um, community members and also Asian community members. 14% of the citizens of this city are born out in the wider world and come here. Um, and a, almost a quarter of our population are living, um, living uh, through poverty. So um, the last Um, in communities that are like 20 to 46 percent of the community members are again living in poverty right so that's even higher um, in a lot of cases than the city overall um, our neighborhoods might be as much as like 89 percent black or folks of African descent and um, they might be as much as almost 60 percent Latinx um, with the exception of one of our libraries that we have partnered with exclusively during the pandemic because of their interest in our programming, um, that is that is kind of what we're what we're doing here. And and with those fifty four libraries throughout the city, that means just about wherever you are, you're within a mile or a mile and a half of a library, right? So that just gives you some context of um, how our city is laid out. So. Um, no really fancy slides, just a little bit of somebody cooking some food in a library in North Philadelphia. But I'll tell you a little bit about what we do as far as food access, culinary traditions, and community chefs. Um, so this year in particular, Healthy Communities has done probably about 60 programs online, right? Um, about a third of our programming has been culinary programming. Um, our culinary programming is our most popular programming, but we also do physical activity programming. So we do yoga programming, we do strength training programming. It was beautiful to hear about all that gardening programming. That was something that we used to do pre-pandemic at this library right here. Um, but a lot of our focus is on, so for us, food access, um, we give gift cards for participation in our programs. My sister program, so Healthy Communities is one of three programs under the Culinary Literacy Center. Um, my sister programs are Nourishing Literacy um, and Edible Alphabet. So Nourishing Literacy uh, has the mission of providing community-oriented, multidisciplinary interactive programming um, for youth educators and caregivers, right? So the primary focus of that program is young people and the supporting the folks around young people and making cooking engaging for them. Um, Edible Alphabet, um, as you may suspect, is an English language learning program, right? So there's a focus on vocabulary, grammar, um, listening and speaking, reading and writing in English with delicious hands-on cooking programs. Um, so through our programs, um, we do food distributions. Um, as a collective body, we do food distributions, we give out gift cards, we focus on recipes that are affordable. Um, and sometimes that means very simple ingredients that can be um, prepared in multiple different ways. Um, I'm like, what else stands out? So one of our partners or one of the, the organizations that we partner with is called Old Ways. Maybe you are familiar with Old Ways, um, but Old Ways has two curriculums that we use, a taste of African heritage and a taste of Latin American heritage. Um, and those programs focus on culinary food traditions, but also the food is predominantly vegan, low salt, low fat, right? And so it's about eating cu culturally relevant foods that are inherently and naturally healthy. Um, we average about 15 participants per program online so far this year. Um, yeah, and that's that's a lot of, of what we've been able to figure out. Um, our chefs that we work with, they may be community members that we've trained. So in 2018, we trained um, about 18 community members. We partnered with an organization in New York called uh, Just Food to train folks. Um, then they came down and did, again, a culturally relevant, um, strength-based, trauma-informed training to prepare folks who are community members to cook in their communities. Um, beyond that, we also work with folks who are partnered with other organizations. One of our chefs um, is an educator who has a background in public health. Um, another one of our chefs works with a food access organization in Philadelphia called the Hunger Coalition. Um, so that's a bit about what we do and, and how we do it. And I'm just super grateful to be here with you all to hear about your work um, and super grateful to share my work with you. Here is my contact information if you have more questions. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aurora. That was that was great. And I'm wondering, you know, as, as I was hearing you talk, I was just thinking about, you know, all of the people that you mentioned, you know, all of the partners, all of the organizations, you know, the training, the, the everything, you know, it's a, it seems like it's a very comprehensive program. Um, and it seems like it's, it's successful because of those multi stakeholder partnerships that have been being able to be developed there. And I'm wondering if you can just kind of touch on that a little bit. I mean, I, I'm sure there's, there's many different aspects of the, the library, you know, many different programs, of the library that are all working with different partners. Um, but how has 
has this program been able to collect, you know, such a, a great diversity of, of programmatic partners to be able to make this a success? Wonderful. I think part of it is, you know, thankfully, despite the challenges that we face as an organization, this organization has a great reputation, right? And I think when you look at just our sheer number and our presence around the city of Philadelphia, um, it gives you a context of like how connected we have the capacity to be. That's one of the reasons why the, the funder for this current project, the Department of Public Health chose us because of our presence in every single neighborhood in the city. I also wanna say I have a fantastic funder. You know, my funder is not afraid of asking the hard questions, is not, my. my funder brings it to the table to us in the language when we originally were funded it was about we were supporting um, and, and lifting up the voice of community members who were practicing health in the face of racism sexism transphobia homophobia islamophobia right like we name that stuff in our work um, and then on top of that, we we bring a certain level of love and care to this, right? Like my colleagues and I, though we are all, you know, frayed at the edges at this point, um, we love being in the community. You know, we love the work that we do, uh, and it 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 it, it is able to um, it it's able to sustain us. And, and, and again, align with many organizations that, that share this mission. I didn't even get a chance to talk to you about some of the work that happens outside the Culinary Literacy Center. There are libraries all around the system that have done mutual aid work, right? And they're partnering with even smaller organizations, right? And organizations that we are not currently partnering with because they have that capacity, right? So we're talking about individual librarians at any point in the city who are partnering with these other smaller, um, smaller entities and having folks come and pick up um, pick up food boxes that the city of Philadelphia is making available to folks. So there's just been, you know, it's a massive, massive effort. And there are so many unsung, um, so many unsung actors in this, in this great, great work. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Aurora. And, you know, we might get back to some of that uh, kind of mutual aid talk and, and resilience uh, as we, as we move forward. Um, great. Well, so our final presentation is going to be coming from Patrice. Um, so if you're ready to go. And I, I am. Um, Aurora, that was amazing and a very tough act to follow. So I'll try. Um, hi, everybody. Um, still, still morning time here in California. Um, so as Tom mentioned, um, I'm coming from a slightly different perspective in that I'm not a librarian. Um, but up until about 2018, I was actually managing a statewide anti-hunger coalition here in California. Um, the coalition was comprised of school districts, food banks, um, youth development organizations, and our State Department of Public Health and State Department of Education. And we were tasked with uh, identifying how we could help more kids in California access USDA summer meal programs and address childhood hunger when school is out. Because um, we had found that only about 20% of California's kids in need were accessing uh, USDA summer meal programs here in California. So we were really trying to figure out how we could uh, get more kids to take advantage of those free meals. Um, and, and especially knowing that what is great about USDA summer meal programs is that they're available to all children and teens 18 and under, no paperwork, no questions asked. So it really is a, a theoretically accessible program. So uh, we really were struggling to address the issue of what the barriers were um, and, and why kid, more kids weren't taking an advantage of them. And as Erica mentioned um, in the beginning of, of the webinar, you know, those rural issues um, you know, transportation um, and, you know, access to food are a big issue, but we also found that even in big cities, you know, access to transportation, working parents, those things are issues in cities too. So we really had to get creative in thinking about how to address food access and out of school time, knowing that when school lets out for summer break in normal times, of course, um, that many, many kids lose access to uh, the nutrition that they relied upon all year long. So we knew that the lack of programming and, um, uh, and having an appealing summer meal site um, was part of the issue. We knew that a lot of the school districts were serving meals at their campus, but you know, after 
spending 180 days in school and being excited about summer vacation, kind of the last place that kids wanted to go back to was their school to pick up a free meal when there wasn't any kind of programming available for them. But we also had the issue here in California where so many of the summer learning and enrichment programs and library budgets too um, had really been decimated from the 2008 financial crisis. And so really just by sheer coincidence at one of our coalition meetings, um, one of our colleagues from the city of Oakland mentioned this super successful pilot project um, that they had done by serving summer meals at the library. And until that point, libraries were not even on our radar as potential partners. So knowing that um, you know, this presented a new opportunity, I think pretty much from that moment, on we realized we were we in you know child hunger and nutrition world we were way off the mark because it made us realize that we really hadn't been thinking about this from a whole child whole family perspective um, and agencies may work in silos but uh, children and families don't so um, that from that moment on it really was um, a, a strong message to us that we needed to be thinking more holistically and how we addressed um, how we addressed uh, childhood hunger in the larger context of what was happening in the community and kind of those what other critical community issues were happening that we could address simultaneously. So um, again, at the time I was working for the Summer Meal Coalition, um, but when I approached California Library Association, it turned out that you know, the people in their world were having the same conversations about summer learning loss and, um, you know, children being hungry while spending time in the library. So that was when we decided to collaborate. Um, and so in 2013, we received uh, both the Summer Meal Coalition and California Library Association received funding from the David and Lucille Packard Foundation to pilot what we called Lent at the Library across California. And the idea was to pilot this at 13 different libraries across the state, because obviously in a state uh, the size of California, there is no one size fits all. And we knew that what might work in Oakland might not work in Fresno or would look different in Los Angeles or in a rural part of the state. So we, what we did was we piloted lunch at the library um, at these 13 libraries, did some uh, brought our respective expertise and knowledge of the acronyms in each of our universes um, and, and did some matchmaking. And what we did from that was we developed, uh, uh, we really captured all of the best practices, innovative programming and partnerships idea, partnership ideas. Uh, we developed evaluation tools to help libraries capture their successes. And then we developed just a suite of resources so that we could help scale that um, bigger and across California to more libraries. And that way, um, you know, when we came across, you know, a very tiny library that thought, oh, I could never do this in my library, we could then say, ah, yes, we, you can actually, here's how a library similar to yours did it. And here were the challenges that they faced, here's how to address them. So that really helped us um, ex exponentially grow um, summer meals through uh, public libraries in California. So, you know, fast forward to 2019, um, we had more than 230 libraries offering summer meals across California. Um, and even uh, last year during the, you know, in the peak of the pandemic, many of those libraries continued, um, you know, because that foundation had been there, uh, many of those libraries continued to do grab and go meals and pro and offer grab and go programming. And many of the other libraries that couldn't serve meals at their library um, took their programming and brought it to other community meal sites, um, mostly school districts. So it really just kind of continued um, the fluidity of those uh, food and literacy and enrichment partnerships with different um, school districts and other community partners. So um, my colleagues are still managing the Lunch at the Library program, and I am now moving, I have been working for the last few years on expanding one, 
one aspect of Lent at the Library called the Build, Building Healthy Habits Initiative. And this initiative is really just kind of expanding Lent at the Library um, and adding breadth and depth to a focus on um, very young children and really thinking about how we can intentionally um, build healthy habits among very young children while also supporting uh, early learning skills. And I think especially during COVID, we know that, these, that the youngest children uh, have really been left far behind um, without access to childcare programs, parents and caregivers may or may not be working. We know there's a lot of family stress and mental health issues. Um, some of our pediatricians here um, serving low-income communities have told me that they are seeing, in addition to mental health issues, they're also seeing speech delays and weight gain. So, you know, this is really a timely effort, um, and, and the goal is to both increase access to healthy food through summer meals and um, help young children try new foods, expose them to new foods. Um, you know, many of these meal service programs are providing food that may or may not be familiar to kids. It may not be culturally familiar, may just not be something that they have access to at home. So really finding ways to introduce young children to new foods, um, connecting uh, early library, early childhood programs, and integrating uh, themes of nutrition, food literacy, physical activity, and gardening. And part of that includes working with local health departments and our state public health department, and, and really kind of strengthening that connection between early learning and literacy and healthy living. Because we obviously know that nutrition is critical to uh, brain, social, and emotional development, and that's linked to better academic outcomes. And similarly, literacy is linked to better health outcomes. So uh, we're really trying to uh, broaden the, the partnerships and collaboration um, to do that. Um, and these are just a couple of quick examples of some of the grab and go kits that we developed. Again, you know, here in California, um, the majority of our libraries are not very well resourced, but because we've been able to bring in resources from other agencies, largely our public health departments um, and USDA, it's really allowed us to leverage the existing resources that are there um, without costing a lot of money. So um, this is a quick example. Uh, many of our libraries served the USDA Farmers to Families boxes. Um, and so we developed uh, just an activity card so that we could create kind of a sensory experience where children, young children would get to sort that produce, uh, but also kind of developing those early learning skills. Um, these two uh, uh, cards are from the health department, which provide an opportunity to increase food literacy and expand vocabulary and get beyond yummy and yucky. And on the back, there's actually recipes to um, create flavored waters in an effort to um, reduce consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. So, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for collaboration. Um, between health-related agencies, other early childhood agencies, and libraries. Um, and, and again, it's really just about identifying the resources that we already had in most of our communities and figuring out a way that we could tailor those collaborations um, to serve different populations. Um, and so I think kind of, you know, thinking you know, what made this work so well in California? Why have we had success? Um, I think largely has um, relied on the amount of effort we've put into educating other agencies and electeds about libraries and how they are not just about books. And you all know that. Um, and I know that um, it's always an ongoing mission to try to educate others about how libraries really are serving whole person needs um, and really identifying what those shared goals are. Um, and kind of um, just as an example, um, you know, we do a lot of work educating law enforcement agencies. Law enforcement agencies are really focused on literacy as 
you know, a crime prevention because obviously the, the connection there. So, fig, but they also um, understand issues of food insecurity in many of the communities that we work in. So with one of the local sheriff's departments, we actually started offering free books in the lobby of one of the local jails and promoting uh, summer meals at the lunch at the library. Um, that way kids that were coming to visit an incarcerated parent not only would get information about the summer meal program happening at local libraries, but they also could leave with books. Um, so really kind of figuring out how to create that shared language and um, shared goals um, was really instrumental. Uh, here also, um, we really have taken advantage of every possible platform um, to, to, again, you know, promote that libraries are not just about books and really um, show others what libraries are doing. And, and so I've included just a couple examples um, for those that are interested in expanding that the health and nutrition work. And, and actually, I, I will even add, this isn't just about food. I think now more than ever, um, we need to be talking about how libraries are helping um, to use food as a way to support family and family mental health um, because we are just we're not just nourishing bodies through the food that all of these amazing libraries are serving um, yeah, so working with your health departments and uh, state leagues of cities and really just kind of um, helping promote that libraries are a link between cities counties and schools and helping leaders um, you know, use that as a way to increase collaboration. And with that, I will um, say thank you and pass it back on to you, Tom. And uh, here are some additional resources, um, all of which are free if you want to check them out or download them. All right. Thank you, Patrice. And, you know, I think that that you actually just uh, left us on a, a great segue, um, which I, I kind of want to talk about a little bit more is, is really, you know, how best to um, how communities can be working with their libraries um, to be able to bring some of these programs uh, you know like what what is that um, what does that communication look like you know what does it look like to develop a partner partnership and 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 specifically I'm thinking about you know if there is somebody in a community maybe it's somebody who's a farmer maybe it's not maybe it's just somebody who's who sees a need um, you know, what does that, that process look like? And I'm going to maybe kind of push it back to, to Erica um, real quick to, to, to start with answering this. And, and just from your experience, you know, as a, as a librarian, you know, what, what are you, what are you hoping for in those types of interactions? You know, what, what makes, what is going to help be a little bit more successful? I guess the first thing I want to say is, um, just because nobody's done something before doesn't mean it can't happen. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. And our program, the Farm to Library program started because I was having a conversation with an outreach coordinator at a local hospital. And they were trying to improve health outcomes in specific counties, um, in the counties that we serve because of being in rural food deserts and incidents of um, diabetes and obesity and everything are really high where we are. So, um, but they couldn't figure out how to get to where the people were. And I was like, hey, have you thought about sharing food through our libraries? And they were like, oh. And so just because people haven't included libraries before, it's just because we're not on their radar. It doesn't mean that they're not willing to work with us. And so I think that I'm a big believer in asking for what you want and need and um, just believing in something and making it happen. And I also just, I realized I didn't put in context, like the, the libraries that are as part of this program, most of them are, um, have at least half of them have part-time directors, so our directors aren't working more than 20 hours a week, and their budgets are below $100,000 a year. So I want to say that this work, like really meaningful um, work that has a really positive impact on your community can be done on any level. Like there's no reason not to do great work, right? And 
the other thing that we've seen in our work that I think is really important is when you tap into community partners and you pool your resources, your impact, your collective impact is so much greater. And it also um, reveals this lie that somehow we live in a world of scarcity. We don't. We live in an incredibly abundant world. And the one thing we have learned through this is that there is more than enough food to feed everybody. Nobody should ever be hungry. We've got enough for everyone. It's just a matter of getting it to them. And um, I also want to talk, just mention one thing. Sometimes when you work with partners, people have interesting ideas. I was told by a number of people who work in this space or in adult literacy that the program wouldn't be successful because people in this income or in the income range that might be enjoying our food um, wouldn't like fresh fruits and vegetables, that they like um, processed foods and other things. And I just wanna say, there's nothing more hateful than saying that. Everybody deserves, and the food that we're sharing for the most part is local, it's all local, it's overwhelmingly organic, and everybody is happy to have it. Teens are there gobbling cucumbers, like fresh out of the bag, like this, I really want to like, just crush that sense. Just because people haven't had access doesn't mean they're not going to love it, and doesn't mean they don't deserve it. Yeah, thank you for that. And and I think that um, you know that one thing that you really touched on there was to uh, you know, the need the need to release you know prejudices and uh, you know perceptions of of people you know that the othering that you're talking about you know like well you know maybe I would like that produce but somebody else is is not going to like it because of their social economic status you know whatever that is um, is is really important I mean but whenever we we design a program or or go into a partnership um, it's it, it it really does take a lot of listening and um, kind of letting go of some of those biases to be able to come up with something really strong. And, and what I, I liked about, you know, something you said earlier at the beginning, and, and this was, uh, I, I think, kind of echoed by Aurora as well, um, was, you know, these, the, you, you mentioned your program, uh, you know, you're giving away this food, there's no, there's no questions asked. And, and a lot of these programs, you know, the, the summer feeding programs, um, you know, all, all these things, um, you know, there's, there's no questions asked, the, the food is there and available, you know, it, it is, a form of, of mutual aid, you know, of community support, both both for the community, but also, you know, of, of the community as well. I mean, the, you know, when it comes to the supporting of, of local, um, uh, of local farms and, and, and integrating, uh, you know, supporting the, the farmers as well, you know, it, it really is seems like a, some really great um, mutual beneficial relationships that have been developed there. Um, well, I think it's even more than that. I think it's about love. It's really about showing love for your community and understanding that our well-being is tied up with our communities, that we have to really love the people we serve. Mm -hmm. And I think here in California, you know, what we tell other agencies and uh, the message that we promote is that food brings people together. It's one of those few things that, you know, it cuts across all lines, you know, as you said, it's love. Yeah. So I, I want to um, just remind people that are listening, if you want to put in any uh, questions in the chat, um, please feel free to do that or, or in the Q&A section, we are taking questions there. And um, so I want to just go to some, a couple of those questions right now before I forget. Um, and, you know, one of them was, was around, um, you know, talking specifically about the, the gardening programs and, and the food and uh, distribution on that front, you know, farmer's market or the, you know, the seed sharing and, and, and tool sharing that are involved there. Um, there was a question, you know, about are these programs only happening during the kind of summer growing season? You know, are they, are they year round? Uh, and how has that decision, if it's one way or the other, um, been made? I can speak to that a little bit. Our market does run from April through November, so it is the South Carolina growing season, simply because we did move away from a wholesale producer, uh, produce farmer, not farmer, but wholesaler, um, 
to a more local model simply because we want to support the farmers in our community in our community um, that does not mean that our library of things is not year round so we do make that that available to everyone year round but we did find that both customers at our market vendors at our market wanted to move toward a very local organic model Thank you. Um, so another question that came in, in here, and this is from Sarah, um, was asking about, you know, we, we're talking about health and, and we're talking, you know, and we're specifically kind of focusing on, on food, but wanted to kind of open it up a little bit to just uh, general kind of community health. And, and I think, you know, the libraries are increasingly uh, become um, centers for community health. You know, many libraries now have social workers um, that are working as part, you know, or that there's some partnership with local social services. Um, and the, the specific question that came in was around um, uh, things around like personal product, products, such as sanitary products and period poverty and, and kind of helping to kind of uh, address some of those issues. Um, and I'm wondering if any of, you know, either a your library systems that you're working in or, or those that you're associated with um, have uh, any of those programs that you can talk about? And if there is kind of, if there is a, uh, any kind of like a more umbrella, um, kind of more holistic view of, of health um, that your programs are a part of through your library systems. And Tom, I'm actually going to just jump in. I think that's yep. the perfect question for Aurora, since you mentioned that your healthy communities umbrella. Do you want to you want to say more about that? Thank you. Um, so we do have social workers at our main library. We're currently um, there's a new program coming off the ground that's going to bring social workers to another area of our city. Um, there have been multiple um, programs at the main. So to be clear, the Culinary Literacy Center is technically a department at our main library, which is downtown. Um, but the majority of my programming in particular happens all throughout the city. Um, there have been, over the years, I've been with the Free Library since I was a work study student in 2004. Um, over the years, there have been more opportunities than I can count um, for folks to receive free clothing, for folks to receive, again, hygiene products of all kinds, especially downtown. Um, in a city like ours, the majority of our folks um, who are transient or who are experiencing housing insecurity wind up in that sort of central area of the city. And so it's very, um, it's been very valuable to have our social workers um, at our main branch. And it's also, you know, deeply valuable to have that kind of work branching out into other communities that have, that are also experiencing um, so much, uh, so much devastation. Thank you. And I guess, uh, you know, one other thing that, that I've been um, kind of wondering about as, as I'm, as I'm hearing all of your, your descriptions of your programs and, and we, you know, uh, I think are rightfully focusing on so much of the success that you've, you've been having, especially, you know, a lot of these programs, it sounds like have been, you know, piloted in the last five years or so, sorry, in the last five, and, and it really speaks to this larger transition that's happening across, you know, really all around the world, um, what, that the libraries are, 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 are making, you know, that are um, increasingly offering new programs, being more dynamic and really feel, feel, filling this, this key um, role as being a community center. I mean, one, one of the things that, that I really love about libraries, and this is something we talk about a lot at, at Shareable, um, is how libraries are a common denominator. Like they really are open to everyone. And no matter kind of what your, your socioeconomic class might be, like people have a strong connection with libraries. When you, when, and I know there's, I can't remember the exact numbers right now, but I know is uh, there's been many polls about, you know, the trustworthiness of public institutions and libraries are always like right there at the top of public institutions. Um, and so, we, like I mentioned, you know, we're really kind of been focusing on these, some of these core programs that you're leading and, and how it's, and how they're working. I'm kind of wondering, you know, in the last couple of minutes, uh, if, if we can talk a little bit about some of the things that haven't worked, you know, where's, where's some of the, you know, cause I, cause uh, for every single one of these programs that I'm sure is success, there's been some amount of trial and error that's, that's, that's led to that. Um, and I'm wondering, um, you know, 
maybe we can um, jump to back to uh, Patrice real quick. Um, you know, if, if you can kind of speak to some of that experience that you've had as you were starting to expand that program uh, across the state of California. And, and one of the things that I was thinking about when you were presenting was just the fact that California, um, like, you know, much of the United States is increasingly uh, multilingual. And, uh, you know, wondering if you can kind of speak at all to any issues that you've had around, um, around language and, and being able to, to reach people that, that would be able to use your programs. Uh, definitely. That's a great question. Yeah, definitely not just language, but language and culture and literacy level, you know, so much. And, you know, California is so big and diverse that we could be many states within one state. And I think that our goal in developing and expanding Lunch at the Library has really been to provide the templates, but then let the librarians and library staff customize it in a way that works for their community. And, you know, they know um, who their community members are um, and kind of, you know, what what they need to make it culturally appropriate for, um, for their community members and their families. But I mean, even, you know, all of the resources that we develop, we always try to do in English and Spanish since Spanish is, you know, a, a predominant language in California, but even within that, you know, there's so much variation. So it's, it's definitely been a challenge. Um, but again, you know, being able to incorporate other community partners that do have that expertise and the, and are those trusted messengers, because obviously in California too, we also had the issue of ice raids happening. And so that really kind of, um, made the trust with any kind of city or county agency tenuous for a while. And so um, librarians really had to do a lot of work to, you know, uh, ensure that that trust was there um, and that families knew that, um, you know, the libraries were a safe place. Um, so it, it's definitely, you know, always a work in progress to make sure that we're making things um, linguistically, literacy level appropriate and culturally appropriate. Thank you. Um, any and yeah, yeah actually, yeah, let me. Yeah, do we yeah. have a couple minutes left. So I, yeah. I love to. So we're having a and so just on that note, and we're getting some questions about how do you get started, kind of working with your library and and uh, Aurora I mentioned in the sidebar, Philadelphia is a city of neighborhoods, and and innovation really comes from that really local level. Um, and and Aurora, I'd love to maybe maybe if you you have a particular example of kind of a local partnership, kind of someone comes to the library and and maybe in that there's some lessons for for folks who want to kind of get started really doing something at the local level with their librarian. Awesome. Um, it's so funny that you you did a shout out to Marrero. Marrero with that that Charlie Cart picture that was at Marrero. That's one of my one of my home libraries, the first library that I worked with. Um, we have been fortunate over the last few years. We have community organizers, right? And so some of what happens is our community organizers building relationship with folks, and then from there developing programming, right? And just positioning, right? It, it's important to have somebody in the role. I think depending on the structure of the space, that's going to really just support that partnership. That's going to help bring the community in and, and make space within the organization for the community to be there. I think that's one of our greatest challenges. It's not always easy to figure out how we as an institution work with community members. Um, and so putting some intention there and also as a big part of healthy communities, we, again, we give out gift cards in addition to giving out food for participation. We pay community members to do programming. Um, so I just want to really encourage you all to value your community members um, as assets, right? They may not, you know, depending on what community you're serving, they may come with a very different set of social and emotional skills and a, a way that they present those things. They may come with a very different set of uh, a very different educational level, um, but they have managed to survive this long, right? Right? And they have managed to survive in spite of many, many obstacles that have tried to take them down, right? And so just really hold a lot of space for the value of individuals, even those who may not be presenting their value in a way that stands out to you. Um, and again, reward that with not only attention and intention, but with financial reward, you know, again, especially in a city like mine, where one out of four people um, is, is possibly living in poverty. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Aurora. And, and you know, I, we are just kind of getting to the, the end of this, and we want to honor people's time, both of our speakers and also everyone who's attended. Um, and so I will just say, you know, that we are going to be releasing the, the video for this next week and the audio as well um, as a bonus episode on the Cities at Tufts uh, Lectures podcast um, that Charitable is a partner on. Um, I also want to call attention to all of the, the great resources that have been put into the chat. Um, you know, wonderful questions, but that people have been posing and, 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 you know, answering the questions that we've been asking the panelists, you know, people have been answering the chat as well. Um, but there's also a number of, of really good resources and there's uh, links to kind of uh, articles that we've been publishing on Shareable about how to uh, start working with a local library and how to, uh, how to approach that, um, how to start a library of things. Um, I think that uh, just right now there's going to be a link put in uh, on how to, uh, we've got a free ebook on how to, uh, are all about uh, libraries of things as well. Um, and so, you know, you can download that, that from, from Shareable. Um, and, and so we're going to be sending out a kind of a set of these resources as well as the, the podcast and, and video um, and also the transcript to this conversation. So if there's anything that somebody said that you want to grab, we're going to share that as well. Um, and we're going to be emailing that out to everyone that uh, registered for the event. Uh, so don't worry about that. You should anticipate that by midweek next week. Um, so just to, to finish right now, um, I would like to just kind of ask everyone, we're going to go down the line maybe once and, and just, you know, 30 seconds to a minute maximum. I'm just going to keep it really short. Um, I'm wondering if you can just kind of say, you know, where are you going next? Like, what are you looking at as, uh, you know, and specifically focusing around uh, kind of uh, meeting uh, this kind of uh, issues around uh, food insecurity? Um, what is what is on your horizon? Uh, and, you know, I think we we started with Erica to begin with. So I'm going to swap the air, the, the, the order. I'm going to put Patrice on the hot seat and, and we'll start there and we'll work back down the line. Oof, that's a tough question. I have, um, I think I'm usually thinking of new ideas 24 hours a day of what I would like to do. Um, I certainly want to copy all of the ideas that my fellow speakers um, were, are, are implementing. Um, I certainly, one area that I really want to tackle on my long wish list is to really focus on um, food security for families that have food and literacy for kids and families that have somebody, a family member incarcerated, like a, a, an incarcerated parent. I'd love to have that on my horizon to delve in deeper and keep doing more on the early learning side as well. Aurora? Yes. Um, I would say I want to continue to just deepen the practice and deepen the work of supporting community members to be in the space and, and um, having their voices lifted up. And to also, I would say, possibly expand to be in different communities, right? So we've been in a specific set of communities. I would love to see more of our communities involved. Um, we, we chose our libraries because they were staffed in a certain way. And what would it mean for us to be able to support libraries that maybe don't meet that qualification and, and, and bring this, um, this more equitable approach there? Thanks, Aurora. Uh, Leanne? Our plan is to expand our markets to more of our branches. Uh, that should be by the end of the summer. I, we expect to have three more of our branches having their own markets, which in and of itself is fantastic because we could reach different farming communities as well because our county is so large so that we can bring in other partners that way. Um, on, the, on a different topic slightly other than food insecurity, we also hope to try to support our community by expanding our markets to more of, to become more of a maker's market as well. So to uh, support small businesses and entrepreneurs in our community, which we saw was a need during COVID. Thanks, Julianne. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, and Erica? Um, well, we're always thinking of access issues. So the next thing for us is we've started building collections and want to continue to be able to share items that people may not be able to afford at home that would make cooking easier, like crockpots or knives or 
you know, blenders or whatever it is you need to cook fresh vegetables. And the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and I see that there's some libraries doing incredible work in, is telehealth. Um, certainly, this pandemic has highlighted the um, inequity around a number of issues, particularly in rural um, areas, about access to healthcare. And that's one of the things we're looking at. Well, thank you so much. Thanks to all of our panelists and, and thanks to Noah for jumping in and helping with the moderation and also just kind of really curating this conversation. And thank you to, to everyone who attended. I mean, this was uh, a meeting that had a lot of um, a lot of interest. We had over 300 people register for it and, and close to 150 people participate live today and we'll reach the rest with the recording. Um, and this today was, was uh, one, it was a great standalone event. Um, it's also serving as a pilot and we're hoping to make, uh, to do an ongoing series of conversations about kind of innovation in, in health, uh, specifically related to libraries. And, and so um, we're gonna be kind of taking this and, and, and moving forward. And if anybody wants to kind of get involved that's participating uh, as an attendee or, or otherwise uh, today, if you would like to let us know, um, you can go ahead and send an, an email to uh, info at shareable.net. Um, and we're going to be kind of working on, on how this works and, and or kind of how we're going to create this, this more ongoing series uh, in partnership with Let's Move in Libraries, you know, with NOAA and uh, University of North, Car of North Carolina, Greensboro. Um, so on, part of, on behalf of all of our partners and our speakers today, we'd just like to say thank you and we'll see you next time. <laughs>